Welcome to our second to the last session of our conference series, How Austrian Economics Impacted My Life. Uh, I'm Jacob Hornberger, president of the Future of Freedom Foundation, the sponsor of this conference. Uh, for those of you that don't know about FFF, we're a nonprofit educational foundation founded in 1989. And uh, for the last 34 years, we've advanced liberty and the libertarian philosophy by presenting a principled and compromising case for the libertarian philosophy. And of course, the centerpiece of economics and libertarianism is Austrian economics. And so we, so we have this series and we're just really honored to have uh, Joe Salerno here. Now, y'all know that I've been promoting Joe during the last week as one of the real stars of the libertarian movement. And when I read you his bio, you're going to see that I wasn't just blowing smoke here or exaggerating. <laughs> uh, Joe received his Ph.D. in economics from Rutgers University. He is professor emeritus of economics at the Lubin School of Business at Pace University in New York. He's the editor of the Quarterly Journal of Austrian Economics and the academic vice president of the Ludwig von Mises Institute, where he also serves on the board of directors. He has held the inaugural Peterson Luddy Chair in Austrian Economics at the Mises Institute and the inaugural John V. Denson II Endowed Professorship in the Economics Department at Auburn. He's a research associate of the Foundations of the Market Economy and the Economics Department at New York University and is on the board of editors of five academic journals. He has published over 70 articles and essays in refereed journals and scholarly books. His latest book is The Austrian School of Economics in the 21st Century, Evolution and Impact, co-edited with Annette Godard von der Kroon. He's the author of Money, Sound and Unsound by the Mises Institute and is currently writing a book with Patrick Newman on the development of Murray Rothbard as a Misesian economist. In the last years, he has published several articles appearing in peer-reviewed journals, including Oxford Economic Papers, the European Journal of the History of Economic Thought, and the Journal of Institutional Economics. He has testified before Congress several times and published numerous op-eds online at Mises.org, Forbes.com, Christian Science Monitor, Wall Street Oasis, Economic Policy Journal, and others. Salerno lectures frequently throughout the United States and internationally, and more than 50 of his lectures are available online. He has been interviewed on broadcast and online radio and TV shows, including Bloomberg Radio, C-SPAN, Fox News, Fox Business Network, New York Law Line, and RT Television. You can catch his blog at Mises.org blog. Joe, I just can't tell you what an honor and a pleasure it is to have you join us. Thank you for taking the time and take it away. I came to Austrian economics and the libertarian movement in sort of a circuitous way. Um, it started when I was extremely young. Uh, I was 12 years old and uh, we had a cousin of my mother visiting from Italy. And um, everything was going along fine until my my father found out that he was a card carrying member of the Italian uh, Communist Party. So a tremendous argument broke out. And uh, of course, I didn't really know what they were arguing about. But I was very, very interested uh, about what would make my, my father and this other man so, so passionate. Um, um, I was hoping, of course, that my father would throw him out of the house or so something would happen. Interesting. My mother interceded. And to make a long story short, everything calmed down. But from that moment onward, I, I was very interested in reading about communism. And so when I was in sixth and seventh grade, I, I read a lot of books, right wing books of, about communism. And um, and then a little bit later on, the Barry Goldwater campaign uh, began where Goldwater was running um, against Lind Lyndon Johnson. And I uh, was very interested in the campaign. I, was, I, I read the book that Goldwater had or there was ghost written for Goldwater called Contents of a Conservative, in which th there were s s some some libertarian free market positions stated and, and set out um, on economics. Um, and a little bit later on in high school, um, my, my high school was a private boys Catholic um, prep school. And it was very interesting because it was really split between some young um, Catholic uh they weren't priests, they were brothers, an order, uh, a teaching order, um, who were very, very liberal. And uh, they were sort of, uh, Kennedy, they, 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 they like uh, John J.F.K. And, 
and Lyndon Johnson. And um, there was another group that were actors, two or three um, um, teachers, their lay teachers, that were Bur Birchers, that they belonged to the John Birch Society. So, so my high school was very politically charged. We had a lot of debates. And I, 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 became, I became a conservative, not realizing that Gold, Gold, Goldwater was a conservative. Um, I, I began labeling myself as such. And then by, I think it was my, my senior year in high school, I was given an assignment by one of the, the liberal lay teachers that we had. And it was to read both John Kenneth Galbraith's book, Affluent Society, and sections of, of Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations. So Galbraith's prose was 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 very stilted, and he 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 was very you know he expressed his own values and so on. Whereas Smith was very in his writing was very straightforward in analyze, trying to analyze the market economy and explain the social benefits of the economy. So um, after 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 I took that course um, and 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 read Smith. I, I realized I wanted to be an economist, and I never really thought more about it after that. So I went on to, to college um, at, at Boston College, um, which is a Jesuit college. And um, there I um, be started to become more of a libertarian. I discovered um, the, the libertarian movement in my freshman year, and I began reading the, uh, certain periodicals. But the, the, the bombshell really hit when in, in um, my sophomore year, there was a, an article in of all places, New York Times Magazine. And in that article, which was called The New Right Credo, Libertarianism, um, they, they mentioned uh, a, a number of, of, of libertarians, uh, including Murray Rothbard, who they said was the dean of, of the Austrian School of Economics. Now, I was a, 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 an economics major, and I had taken a number of economics courses by that time, uh, including you know, inter principles of economics and, and intermediate macro and micro, but I had never heard of the Austrian school. So uh, I, I, I was very interested about learning more about it. And um, I, I also happened to have that semester uh, a course in the history of economic thought, and the professor there um, introduced us to the old Austrian school of, of Karl Menger, uh, Eugen von Bombavark, and um, uh, Wieser. And anyway, he, he pointed out that it was a unique event in intellectual history. You had three individuals working on a common approach to economic problems. So that 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 whetted my interest even even further. And um, and and so when I mentioned this to, to someone in the Young Americans for Freedom which was a conservative group that had just started that year, um, but also included some libertarians or libertarian leaning people like myself. Um, he said, oh, um, he says, um, let me let me give you this little pamphlet. And so it was a little pamphlet by Murray Rothbard, and it was called Economic Depressions, Cause and Cure. And um, I read it in about 45 minutes. And I realized then and there that the macro courses I had been sitting through, principles of macroeconomics, intermediate macroeconomics, um, fiscal policy, and all these other courses were full, full of baloney. And that the Austrian school uh, in that small pamphlet had, had, had explained back in the 1930s and even earlier uh, what the cause of business cycles were, what the cause of inflation and recession was. So I was very, very impressed by that. And I think at that point, I became an Austrian, not that I had much much knowledge. So when I when I uh, went um, back for the summer, I um, scoured libraries to find works by Mises and Hayek and Rothbard. And I found one in a, in a, in a downtown city that had had a lot of riots a few years before, and nobody was going to that library. So I, I got the books out. And um, that su that summer, I was working as a janitor, um, and uh, I I remember sitting in the janitorial closet with all the cleaning supplies, probably probably poisoning myself from from smelling them. Um, under a, I would I would complete my work very quickly and be done by two o'clock in the afternoon, 
and sit in the room and read America's Great Depression by Murray Rothbard. And of course, to that point, I had never met another Austrian or anyone that even knew about Austrian economics. And so you know, I felt very alone. I, I was alone. I was in a closet by myself reading a book. Um, but when I came out of that closet, I, I was an Austrian, uh, an Austrian economist. I did understand Austrian business cycle theory. Um, and then I um, decided to go to graduate school. Um, I, I, I purchased a lot of, there was a Books for Libertarians that was just starting. It was a mail order um, bookseller. And I, I got all the Austrian books I could get my hands on. I began reading them. I, I went on to um, Rutgers University uh, for a PhD in economics. And I also had become at the same time the vice president of the New Jersey Libertarian Party, which had just started. And we we had a, at our first convention, I was in charge of getting someone to be the keynote speaker. And I, I, I found out that Murray Rothbard just lived across the river in New York City. I was in New Jersey. And I just got up the courage to call him up on the phone and ask him to be our speaker um, for a paltry $75. And he agreed and, and he came over and uh, we were just making small talk uh, before his talk. And I mentioned that I, I was a graduate student in economics at Rutgers University and that I had read his book or a number of his books and I, I was shocked by the reaction. I mean, he, he was so excited and enthusiastic and he, he was frantically searching for a pencil to write my, my number down. And he told me he was going to put me in touch with some people in New Jersey who had a reading group uh, that was that included Walter Block, another one of my libertarian heroes at the time. And uh, he did. So I, I did. I didn't think much of it. I mean, he gave a great talk and then, uh, you know, he left. And then, but a few days later, I, I did get a call from somebody in the reading group and they um, took me to, um, they, they picked me up, brought me to the reading group. I met Walter Block, also Walter Grinder, another a libertarian uh, at the, uh, who was sort of prominent in, in, back in the 70s and 80s. Um, and uh, evidently they reported back to Marie Rothbard that, that they were impressed with me. So that summer, I was invited to, to um, go to his, uh, his his apartment in Manhattan, and uh, where he would host um, uh, libertarians and Austrians. And so um, I was I was a little bit timid. I, I was, you know, I didn't, I was afraid that he would begin asking me things about Austrian economics or, or libertarianism that I would and find out that I really didn't know that much. But anyway, when he, he greeted me at the door, I went with another student. Um, he acted like I was an old friend. He says, oh, Joe, my boy, come on in. And um, it was a great, great evening. He did ask a lot of questions uh, on, 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 on libertarianism and my views on certain things and, and also about Austrian economics. And um, we had a few interesting interchanges. At one point, we were discussing what, what should be done to looters people who loot um his position was that uh, well you could you could you can use force obviously to protect your property from a looter but that if a looter got a hold of your property and was running away with it you couldn't shoot him down you, you could use deadly force in protecting your property but you couldn't if he ran away so i kind of sheepishly objected i said well certainly if you can shoot him in protecting your property you can shoot him in recovering it i don't see why you have to call the police in that case and so he responded, ah, he says, you're someone I can have. Now, that's something I can have a conversation about. So he, he, he whenever you, you, you gave a more radical position than he had, um, he was very happy. I also remember discussing, it's pretty interesting, um, views on what would happen after the libertarian revolution. Um, what should happen to state-owned property? So I suggested that it be sold off and, and the money given back to the taxpayers, or that it could be given to... Um, for example, the postal workers could be given the post office and and the public schools could be given to the teachers. And he didn't like he didn't like either of those alternatives um, because they involved the state having to uh, carry out some duties and not and also wouldn't get the property back quick enough. So his his solution was that it should go to the heroes of the libertarian revolution, which I thought was, was pre pretty funny. Um, 
but it, all in all, he was a great guy. And, um, I became, fr- I became pretty good friends with him. And, uh, Later on, uh, when after I became a professor at, at Pace at Rutgers University and then Pace University, we would meet for luncheons and uh, in New York City and Manhattan. And he uh, he, he was just so intellectually um, humble. Um, he liked re- and actually before I I, I I talk a little bit about that. Um, he also like real real people what he called real people people had real jobs in the real world people who liked american culture um like himself he loved he loved james bond movies he loved matt helm detective novels um he he liked he 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 really esteemed the godfather movies i mean he was really embedded in american culture because he believed that it had really developed out of a quasi laissez-faire system so it was a natural cult, a natural culture. Um, excuse me. Um, so I was, I was at a, a few conferences with him, <clears throat> in which there, there was, you know, from which I have some interesting anecdotes. Um, at one conference that I was at, um, we he he was notorious for being a, a night owl and staying out late and wanting to talk to the graduate students and and other young professors uh, late into the evening. So one night he wanted to go out and get something to eat at, at midnight. Um, and he loved Denny's uh, restaurants. Anyway, I had a car and uh, a bunch of us piled into the car and we, we, were, we searched for an hour for some place to eat and every place was closed. This was Hartford, Connecticut, not, not a, really a hopping city. And uh, so he was complaining the whole way. He says, don't these people know that it's, it, it, that the industrial revolution occurred 200 years ago. We have electric lights now. Why can't you serve consumers at night? So he was he was quite distressed. But I found uh, uh, an open pizza place in driving around, and and he he declared me a, a, a hero of the of the libertarian revolution for finding a, a place to eat. Um, and uh, one other interesting conference that I attended with him was one on on kind of a dry topic of economic methodology and it occurred at west point so we were on the west point campus which was very drab and um stodgy and we were in the west point hotel um which which is the um uh, uh west point is is is, is the, the college for for um army uh officers uh in any case um Murray, after the second day, he, he was getting antsy. He, uh, you know, the, uh, it, as I said, it was kind of a dry subject and uh, he, he wanted to get out among the, among the real people. He, he kept telling, he kept telling a few of us, Let, let's go, let's break out tonight and go over the wall and, 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 and go see some music and dancing and, and real people. So we, um, I asked the concierge at the hotel about, about any places that he might know where we, we, we could have some fun, some drinks, some some music and stuff. And he um, pointed us to a place that was 15 miles away. Um, and, and to get there, we had to go along some mountainous roads up to Newburgh, New York. And uh, to, to, as we did so, a, a fog, a very, very thick fog descended. We couldn't see more than, I don't know, 20 or 30 yards ahead. So we were, we were debating, it was about, five or six of us in the car, including Murray, we were debating whether we should turn around and go back. And every time that came up, Murray would say, push forward, troops, push forward. Um, so we wound up finding the place and uh, having a great time. And um, Murray was, there was a lot, I, it was a period of disco music. There was a lot of disco. But Murray had a very good voice and he was singing along with it. And he, he, on the way back in the car, he was serenading us with a few lines that he remembered from from a disco song. I can still remember it was on the radio by Donna Summer. Um, so he just he was just a regular guy um, in his personal life, um, and just just loved laughter and, and and loved you know hanging around and and absorbing absor- absorbing the culture. In fact, when we were at at, at the um, um, the club, he he was saying that um, it was. Uh, um, he was a sociological observer, is how he put it. That, that he was just taking everything in. 
Um, anyway, uh, so when, when I was fortunate, as I said, to have lunch with him uh, an, uh, one or two times a semester. And so when I did have lunch uh, one time, it was during the period that he was writing his, his great work, two volume work on the history of economic thought, Austrian perspectives on the history of economic thought. And it hadn't been published yet. So we, we we sat down to lunch. We were eating lunch, and he talked for about an hour about all the great new good economists that he found, some of the underrated economists who should be better known, or some of the other economists that were well known but were just terrible, and all all the new insights. But it, so I I was fascinated by what he was saying, I and mean, I was just I didn't say a word, which was uncharacteristic. I usually you know we we usually have a back and forth. And so after an hour, he, he he appeared a little bit sheepish, and he said, "Oh, well, I'm sorry, I'm monopolizing the conversation." But that just shows his intellectual humility, because I mean, here here it is. He, he's one of the greatest. Well, he's the greatest Austrian economist um, living at the time, um, and for him to think that I would not be engaged in what he was saying, and that and that I was bored or, or was, was crazy. I I I, it, I you know I was getting a, a private seminar. Uh, about a work that had not yet been published yet, so I was one of the few that was was hearing all this, and 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 it was again something I would have actually paid to hear. So, um, so that, that those are my experiences with Murray, and I, I think um, he's probably the biggest influence. Well, he is the biggest influence, my, my biggest intellectual influence, um, and he he really did um, help me. To develop a research program. Um, so let me just say a few things about about the ideas of Austrian economics that that I think are, are extremely important, and then we'll I'll um, let, I'll take questions. Um, first of all, what's the one of the most important things about Austrian economics? And I, I coined a word to describe this uh, back in the early 2000s, and it's now sort of in general use among Austrian economists. Austrian economics is causal realism. That, that, now, what that means is that it's really aimed at finding out, investigating, and explaining the causes of real prices, interest rates, wages that are paid on real markets in the economy. It's not interested in, 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 in explaining how equilibrium prices are, are formed. If everybody had perfect knowledge, what would prices be? And, if, and because people don't have perfect knowledge, prices aren't perfect. Well, prices are more than adequate to allow entrepreneurs to use these prices to cal economically calculate how or w what are the best and most valuable uses of economic resources, um, so be, because what economics is all about is the and 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 what the economy, where the economy actually comes from, is from human ch beings choosing and acting to satisfy their most important wants. So all the skyscrapers, the factories, the um, airplanes, all the, the the visible manifestation of economic activity that we see can all be traced back and is traced back by Austrian economics to the human soul in some sense, to, to the conflict of desires for different things that we want. And because we have this these conflicting desires for different things, and our wants are unlimited, but yet resources in the real world are limited so that we have to choose. We have to rank things as more or less important to ourselves and then choose to spend our money or our energy or our time in trying to obtain those things that are most important to us. Um, so, and that was the original insight of the founder of the Austrian School of Economics, um, who was um, uh, Carl Menger. Uh, and so th that that's economics. Economics is what we call methodologically individualistic. It, 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 it focuses on the individual and builds up the explanation of the overall economy from individual choices and actions and expectations. And I think that's I, I, how I would summarize Austrian economics. Also, one other point, since we're living in an age where everyone's pushing for socialism, 
unless you have real prices, and that is prices determined on the market by cons by buyers and sellers um, who own not just consumer goods and are buying and selling consumer goods, but who also own factories and uh, their own labor and natural resources and trade these things and 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 thereby cause prices to emerge for those things. If you do not have that, if you don't have prices for every good in the economy, there's no way to determine the most valuable uses of resources. Um, you you need prices of 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 all capital goods, all factories, and so on, in order to calculate your costs. And this is why, by the way. You can never have a real socialist economy because since the state owns all resources, productive resources, by definition, um, it can it cannot determine what its costs are. So socialist production will always be chaotic. And that's another important um, insight that arises or, uh, that that came from the Austrian school, in particular, Mies, this was Ludwig von Mises' argument um, uh, in an article published in 1919, which is one of the most, uh, in 1920, excuse me, one of the most important articles ever written, um, Economic Calculation in the Socialist Commonwealth. And I, I recommend that to everyone. And lastly, before I stop, I just want to mention that um, today there are really two, two, two lines of thought within Austrian economics. Um, one stems, they all, both stem from Karl Menger, but one goes from Menger to Eugen Bombaverk, Menger was von Bawerk's teacher. Von Bawerk was von Mises' teacher. And von Mises, of course, was Murray Rothbard's teacher. So that line of thought goes from Menger to von Bawerk to um, uh, Mises to Rothbard to my generation, who are all older generation now. And now there are two more generations of students that have come through Mises Institute um, programs. Um, and these two two new generations are already professors. Many of them are, are, are professors. Um, so we, we have pe people as young as, as 28, 29 now who have gone through a Mises Institute programs that, that are professors um, and are now starting to send their students to our, our programs. The other, I, I should mention the other, the other line of thought, um, Went through a, went through von Bawerk's brother-in-law, uh, Frederick von Wieser, who taught um, Schumpeter and uh, another economist named Meyer. They aren't as important, but then um, Wieser also taught um, the generation after Mises, Hayek and Machlup. And um, though Hayek was also influenced by Mises, and is, is part of both strands of thought. Um, and and Israel Kurzner is also um, uh, uh, a student uh, or, or a protege of Hayek's, uh, who is part of, and, and of Mises because he he was Mises' graduate assistant. So um, I think I'll end there, and I'll take uh, I'll be happy to take any questions that you may have. Excellent presentation. Thank you so much, Joe. You know we we've had you're our fifth presenter, and you're the first one to really give a really nice synopsis of Murray Rothbard. I mean, everybody's mentioned Rothbard, and of course he's a giant in Austrian economics and libertarianism, but to get these personal accounts is that this is a first is, is really nice to, oh. to learn, learn a little bit. Cause you know, most of us, we just learned about Murray Rothbard from his books and it's um, it's nice to get the personal account. I was, uh, I was, <laughs> I couldn't help but smile when I heard you describing coming out of the closet as, a, <laughs> as, a, as an Austrian. <laughs> and uh and how you were probably had your lungs forever destroyed by those chemicals in that janitor's closet um and then what there was another comment i wanted to make about wait oh yeah now you you were at rutgers when all this was taking place when you were hanging out with murray right i mean is this i was i was at rutgers as a graduate student um, for uh, and and interacting with him as a grad as graduate student. In fact, I did have him come and speak to the faculty um, uh, as a graduate student. But then I graduated. Uh, for, I got my PhD from, uh, and then I went. I, I went on to teach at another camp, Rutgers campus in New Jersey. And so I I didn't see him quite as much. Um, and then I went to Pace University, which is a university in New York City, not too far from where he taught in Brooklyn. And I saw him more frequently then. 
And I, of course, I saw him at a lot of conferences um, and at the Mises Institute. Okay. What I'm curious about is at Rutgers, were you in your graduate program? Did were there Austrians there that you were working under, and did you do your doctorate in Austrian economics? And did Murray have any influence on your doctorate there? And can you oh, tell us a little question. bit about that? Yeah, yeah, I sure, sure will. Um, so the Rutgers University economics department was very, very eclectic. So we had monetarists, we had Keynesians, we had even more. We had post Keynesians who are very, very radical. They're near Marxists. We had supply siders, um, so, and we had Marxists. So it was. A, I, I learned a lot at Rutgers University, but I didn't learn any Austrian economics. I, I did all uh, my learning in Austrian economics from conferences that I was going to, um, uh, and 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 from reading. Uh, my, but fortunately, um, my, one of my professors, who was a Keynesian, um, liked me, thought I uh, was very interested in, in what I had to say about Austrian economics, so he disagreed. But he allowed me to do my dissertation on um, uh, the balance of payments. So I, 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 my dissertation was on uh, the classical school, uh, which um, such as Ricardo and so on, and their balance of payments theory was what influenced Mises. So I was able to get Austrian economics into my dissertation sort of through the classical school. So it, it basically was on monetary theory and 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 how it affects balance of payments, and that. Um, so, uh, and I, I sent the chapters to Murray, who 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 liked them quite a bit, and used some of them, used some of the, of, of my work in his book on uh, later on in his book on um, history of economic thought. So you'll see references to my dissertation in there. Okay, great. Uh, and of course, when you say Ricardo, you're referring to the classical economist David Ricardo. Yes, I am. Okay, uh, let's go to the audience here. There's a number of questions. Uh, this is this one's from Bonita, and she says, considering everything that's already happened with the NATO summit, the BRICS country summit, and especially the OPEC meetings, what do you yourself predict for the foreseeable future for U.S. taxpayers and, and consumers going into 2024 and beyond? Well, I could I could be like I could be uh, like Clubber Lang and say pain <laughs> in the rock from the Rocky movies. Um, I don't see the the Fed stopping its increase in the money supply. This is the root of all problems, and the fact that foreign governments are willing to accumulate dollars, though less and less so, they're becoming less confident in the dollar. But what could happen is if they begin, if places like China and Brazil and so on um, begin unloading the government securities that they own, that will drive into, that is selling them on the world market, that will drive their prices down and it will drive up interest rates. And it will also destabilize our financial system. Um, I, 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 I still don't think that the currency that's being discussed by the BRICS countries um, will replace the dollar. I, I think if we, I think if inflation gets worse, foreign countries are, are, are individually going to begin to diminish their holdings of, of U.S. dollar assets. Okay, uh, this is from an anonymous attendee. Uh, why is methodological individualism important? Why do conservatives critique this framework? Oh, well, I don't know if conservatives critique. This. Oh, they may. But let me just answer the first part first. Methodological individualism is not political individualism. It's just a method of doing economics. That is, in order to, to explain the whole, in order to explain the overall operation of the economy, it's necessary to explain its causes. And that's why Austrian economics is causal realist economics. And the causes lie in human choices. And only individual human minds can make choices, undertake actions, have expectations about the future and act on those expectations. So now conservatives may, may critique it because, and I'm not sure what the, the person is referring to, but because um, they, 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 they may think that, well, there is a sense in which a society or a community exists and can choose. Um, I don't agree with that. Um, a community is made up of like-minded people, certainly people who adopt the same values, but they all, all have to make the choice to adopt and act on those values. 
So the community itself or the United States itself does not act. Okay, certain certain members uh, who are le leaders of the community or leaders of the United States or rulers, they act. Um, and, and they act on their own values. Now, some of those values may reflect those of the American people. Okay. Uh, Harjinder asks, do you think China is more free market than the United States? It, it, it may have been tending in that direction a few years ago, but lately, no, it, 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 it is not. I mean, um, the U.S. is becoming less and less free market, certainly. But I don't think it, it's reached a point where China is it, 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 um, is more free market oriented than than the U.S. Yeah, you know, an interesting aspect of that is you, you'll recall, I don't know what, 10 or 15 years ago when the, there was all this free market intellectual activity going on in China. Cato was having seminars over there and things. Right. What do you think happened there? That seems to have all just gone away. Yeah, I, I, I think, you know, they, there's new leadership with the Communist Party and, and they decided to crack down. Um, now, for what reasons, I'm not sure. But... Um, uh, you know, they, 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 certainly rulers are, are, are of a country like China, uh, you know, a, a one party country, they're, they're they're paranoid. And 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 if they see their their control slipping in the least, they can swing the pendulum back away from 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 moving towards the market. OK, uh, this from Richard. Do you have any advice on how to communicate Austrian critiques of Marxian theory to undergraduates? who are not well-versed in these topics. Are there any classic strong examples or recent examples? Um, well, there's, there's a, a, a very good, um, it's, it's longer than an article. I would say it's a booklet, small booklet by Bombavirk on, on Marxist economics, but that might be a little bit above, above their level. Um, Mises has written in, in, in planning for freedom, it's a book of essays called Planning for Freedom. There are some articles on Marxism in that book. Um, I would suggest that the people, person go online and go to the Mises Institute. There's so many resources and, and just type in Marxism and they'll they'll come up with a lot of, of, of shorter articles that are aimed at at, at the at, at the um, pop, at a popular level. OK, and just in case there are people that later see this video that don't know anything about uh, Austrian economics, it's Mises, M-I-S-E-S dot -E org for the Mises Institute. Um, OK, this from Scott. Did you attend the YAF convention in St. Louis, Missouri in August 1969? And what is your take on that event? I did not attend it. But the but but the fallout from it, um, I I did come in contact with when I joined the Young Americans for Freedom when I was in college a few years later. Um, there were both traditionalists and libertarians, and I think it was a it was a milestone in that libertarians had be, who had become were becoming self aware realized that they they really had nothing in common with the pro war conservatives, uh, the Buckley-I conservatives. Um, so I think that split kind of finalized um, the the um, development, I guess, or the beginning of, 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 the, of the libertarian movement among young people. Yeah, as a, a personal anecdote, that uh, there was a guy there that burned his draft card that set the conservatives off. And, <laughs> yes. <laughs> and, and that was when the big walkout took place. Yeah, well, yeah. Some years ago, I was at a convention and I started talking to this guy about that event. And he says, I'm the guy who burned the draft card. Really? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember what his name was. It's pretty funny. Um, all right. Uh, OK, here's one you'll you'll enjoy. And I'm not sure I agree with this. And I'm not sure. Uh, oh, I guess he says this is from Harjinder again. Hi, Joe. Mises believes in a small night watchman state. I assume he means Ludwig von Mises. Yes. Yet Rothbard believes in no state. Do you know any institute that's core principle is no state? May I suggest a Rothbard Institute? Thanks. Well, I mean, the Mises Institute is, is, is although we welcome um, what, what are called minarchists, people who believe in a very, very small state, um, 
I, I think most of the people associated with the Mises Institute are anarcho-capitalists. Um, that we don't take a, an official position on that, but but I, I think we I think everybody from Lou Rockwell on down to mo- almost all our scholars are anarcho-capitalists. I agree with you. I, I think yeah. Mises is predominantly a narco capitalist and has yeah. been for a long time. Um, all right. Let me see. Uh, okay. Here's a controversial one. Uh, does the Mises Institute hold an open borders view? I hope so. Thanks. If not, why not? Um, I don't think the Mises Institute takes a position on that, or oh, I know it doesn't. Walter Block, for example, who's a prominent scholar associated with the Mises Institute, is totally open borders. Um, other people, such as Hans Hoppe, believes that open borders are, are suicidal. And uh, though he's not against immigration, he would have uh, an immigration where policy, I guess, whereby um, p- b- b- citizens would sponsor people to come and they, they would have prearranged jobs and so on um so we're not close we're not totally closed borders nobody can come in um we range from control you know controlled immigration to to open borders uh, people like walter block right uh okay my son is also listening what could you say to him he's 13 Mm -hmm. years old to convince him not to be a not to become a socialist (laughs) Here's your big challenge, Joe. <laughs> well, uh, there'll there'll be shortages of video games and and um, books <laughs> and and any and and there'll be long lines even for for foods that 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 kids like. I mean that that was all true in the Soviet Union. Children children's clothing was was in very short supply because without prices, um, the targets were how many yards of clothing. Uh, you, you know, was a yards of clothing was a, was a target that was assigned to each cloth uh, textile factory or clothing factory, and um, so they made a lot of large size clothing. So petite women and children um, did, had to wear mis misfit clothing. <laughs> That's a great answer. Uh, one one other question I wanted to ask you was on the socialist calculation uh, situation. I agree with you. That's a critically important point. Can you tell a little bit about the socialist calculation debate that was taking place between what well, was Mises and? Well, there were there were two. One one was in the 1920s between Mises and, and German economists who really didn't know much economics. Um, but then in the 1930s, it was taking place. Mises was involved, but Hayek was involved even more than Mises. And that was between uh, Mises and Hayek on the one hand and, and uh, British economists and American economists. Um, so, um, but, but basically, uh, what, 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 what used to be the, the position before Mises wrote his famous article very briefly, the position was, um, that there were all these crazy socialist schemes out there by what were called the utopian socialists. Um, and you know, everybody would eat in a common kitchen and they had all these plans. Well, that was easily refuted by the classical economists who just asked the question, who's going to take out the garbage? Who's going to do the dirty jobs? in these utopias and so marx realizing that he could not answer the the um the classical economist basically said anyone who talks about what a socialist future might look like is unscientific because socialism is going to come regardless of of what what any of us think it will look like because capitalism is breaking down and will break down so marx then came up with this notion of scientific socialism in which you don't talk about socialism, you only talk about the ills and the and and the destruction caused by capitalism. Um, Mises then pointed out that without prices, you you can't have socialism. So Mises broke the taboo against discussing what socialism would look like, and and what he pointed out was that it would look like chaos. And that's when socialist economists realized he has a point because if the state owns all the property, there will, can be no exchange. OK, there's only a mon- one monopolist who owns all the means of production, so you can't have any exchange. And so you had all these stupid answers in, in, in the 1920s by German socialists who were trying to say things like, well, we'll just tell the managers to do the exact same things 
that they were doing the day before we became a social society. But of course, Mises points out then that then you would never change. There would be no technological innovation. There'd be no response to new consumer wants and so on. So it, Mises easily refuted that. But then in the 1930s, we had much more sophisticated responses to Mises and Hayek. And one of which was, well, we now have what's called general equilibrium theory, which is really trying to describe the economy by a system of equations of supply and demand. So if you had enough information, you could feed them into, you know, you could put them in the form of equations. <clears throat> and then there were no computers then. But if you had had computers, you could then solve those equations for the, the right prices and the right quantities. Um, but Mises and, but first Hayek pointed out, well, first of all, it would be almost impossible to get that information together in a timely fashion. And secondly, even if you did and you solved them, it would be years, you, you know, it would take years because we, they, there were no computers then. Um, Mises took a different view. He said, look, he said, all the equations tell us is what we would have, what, 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 what we should produce and what the prices should be in a never, never world where everything is perfectly adjusted. But in the real world, there's continuous profits and losses. Entrepreneurs are making mistakes. No one knows the future with with with, with certainty. So be, bottom line is Mises' response was mathematics doesn't give you an idea, cannot be applied to a dynamic world where things are constantly changing, errors are being made, and corrections need to be made. That's where you need profits to know what to do and losses to know what to avoid. Okay, excellent answer. Um, can you speak on Rothbard's movie reviews? He seemed to cross all disciplines. Have you ever considered writing on popular topics? Uh, those are two separate questions, I guess. Yeah, so uh, Rothbard loved old-fashioned movies. He loved John Wayne movies. He loved James Bond movies. Those were his two favorite, and, and he thought the best movie ever made was were, were the two Godfather movies, um, which he compared to sort of westerns. He, he thought that you know it, it, it was it was a the gangster movie was also an grew out of American culture, um, and and so he uh, he he thought that the mafia, for the most part, provided goods and services that consumers were prohibited from getting by the state, um, and that they had to use because they couldn't go to courts if if there was any disputes, they had to use ultra as Rothbard would put it, ultra rigorous methods of enforcing contracts. So um, he he liked he thought that the Godfather's the Godfather movie the, the um, Corleone Corleone family they were good guys in some sense. <laughs> okay, I think that wraps it up. Uh, okay, he, no way, I got one more. Uh, from sure, Ro from Rothbard to Hoppe, any comment? I'm not sure what he's referring to, but well, I could just say, say that Rothbard founded his libertarianism on natural law. Whereas Hoppe believes in these ethics of argumentation, which I'm not a philosopher and I, 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 I'm not equipped to explain exactly what that is. But basically, the fact that people engage, once people engage in arguments with one another, saying that socialism might be better than capitalism or vice versa, they're demonstrating the ownership of, of their own bodies. Um, and they're conceding the ownership of the other person's body by trying to convince that person of their view. So that I mean that's that's the foundation of Hoppe's philosophy of um, of of, of uh, libertarianism. But you know, I, you'd have to ask David Gordon if you want to go further than that. He, he's a, a a great philosopher, and he's there at the Mises Institute. Yes, too. he is. Yes. Uh, and, well, you know, Joe, when I put when we put this thing together, we 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 wondered whether there was going to be overlap and duplication. And so far, with five great Austrian speakers, there has been virtually no overlap or duplication. And it's just, I'm glad to hear that. Uh, it's just been a fantastic series, and you really wow. you brought Murray Rothbard to 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 life for us here. It's a really really nice. So I just thank I, you. Yeah, I thank you. Appreciate your. All the okay. work you've done for Austrian economics and libertarianism. Uh, and and if people want to get more, I guess, your blog there at Mises.org. Any, anything else you'd recommend? Yeah. No, they, they, can, they can just look on Mises.org. I, I have um, hundreds of, of popular articles on uh, there. Um, so um, there, is, there is a Fed movie that we, we have. We have a Fed movie that we 
uh, a video that was made in 1996. That's being updated and should be done in in a year, um, within the year, uh, about you know the new the new Fed, the so-called new Fed, which is really the old Fed, old old wine and new bottles. <laughs> Joe, I can't thank you enough. Uh, it's All been right. an honor and a pleasure. Thank you so much for taking the time to share personal anecdotes as well as your insights into Austrian economics. Okay. Pleasure was mine. Okay. Good night. Good night.